is beaten. Let your devotion to justice temper your rage. He took your parents, ruined your life. Fulfill your destiny. You don't have to be Batman TAS, aka the animated series, to go hard. While the 90s Batman cartoon is understandably and justifiably iconic, it can have the ripple effect of causing other Batman series to be summarily dismissed. This factor was part of what happened to Batman the Brave and the Bold, a Batman cartoon that will oft times find itself overlooked. It's not the only one, but it's the one we're focusing on today. That series was from the late 2000s, early 2010s, I guess late aughts. It ran from 2008 to 2011. And as far as iterations of Batman go, it had slash has a lot to offer. And while it tended to focus on a lighter, more Silver Age tone, it could also be presented in a darker manner. And regardless of which tone it was opting for, and oft times it was a mix of the two depending upon the episode, it contained some of the strongest Batman episodes out there. And we're going to take a look at one in the darker category today. One that's from an iconic moment of Batman history. We're going to be looking at the very well executed episode, Chill of the Night, the 11th episode of the second season, which aired in 2010. This episode has so many things. Poignant voice actor casting, many references to a whole host of Batman era, and specific runs, as well as making a strong case for how deliberate that fun tone was in this series. This by showcasing how easily it slipped into a darker one, but maintained the overall rules of the universe it was working in. And again, it did that more often than people took note of. This show went pretty hard. I got a comment on my last video that we did talking about Batman Brave and the Bold by someone who claimed to work on the show, we're going to go with the idea that they did, where they said that there wasn't a lot of oversight over this show because it wasn't heavily promoted, and so some things got to slip through. And if you've watched the show, I believe it. The show had a lot of people die. R.I.P. Ted Cord. R.I.P. Barry Allen. And others. So many others. People die in the episode we're about to look at. I'm Sasha. This is Casually Comics. And let's take a look at the time that Batman Brave and the Bold got dark. I mean, he is the Dark Knight after all. It was right there. It was so low. Some of you clicked off. I'm so sorry, but I had to do it. Every time I do one of those, I get a comment that's like, it ruined the entire video. And you know what, that's fair. Now the main part of this episode, because there's a little teaser before with Zatanna and Batman, but in the main story, we're dealing with one of those humans are but pawns for the gods cosmic. Some big entities need to prove a point about the nature of good and evil or vengeance versus justice. And they're gonna use the poor people on planet earth to do it. It's a classic. In this story, it's the Phantom Stranger and the Spectre. But that setup is very reminiscent of say DC Legends from 1986, the first DC universe wide miniseries after Crisis on Infinite Earths, which saw the Phantom Stranger and Dark Dark side embroiled in an argument as to whether good would triumph over evil. Would the earth turn against its heroes? Dark side sure thought so, and he worked hard to try and make it happen. In this one, however, we're looking at Batman. Will Batman stay the course of his mission if confronted with the murderer of his parents? Or his parents' murderer? Why did I phrase it that way? Phrasing, but not in the fun way. This is a common framing device in general, but if done well, it can be a fun and entertaining one. The interesting part tends to come from the character's reactions rather than the setup itself. However, our frame in this case does have some nice nods, as the Phantom Stranger is voiced by Kevin Conroy, aka the Dark Knight himself from Batman TAS and many, many other Batman projects. And the Spectre was Mark Hamill, aka the Joker. Same tagline applies. A lot of this episode will center around some early parts of Batman's history, his origins and expanded origins, and some tweaks that have been made to it over time. This was something that Brave and the Bold would often do, incorporate elements from many eras and kind of meld them together inside of its new kind of own canon. It created a very unique feeling universe, and one where so many factors were in play. It was a lot of fun. So for this, we get to open on the death of Batman's parents, a classic. We've seen it so many ways, pick your poison. It's definitely something that has been played out, and yet there's something about seeing it here in this series series, which usually doesn't have this somber of a tone that makes it really resonate. The animation, which had been deemed by some as blocky, ugly, or childish, really conveys the emotions. The expression on young Bruce's face is haunting. Now, Batman's origin was first given in Detective Comics number 33 in 1939, and all the bones were there in 12 panels. We got it all. The Waynes going home from a movie, robbed at gunpoint, murdered in front of their son, who swore vengeance and trained to become Batman. Over the years, more details would emerge, and you would add more layers and some little things would be tweaked. You would add things like them cutting down a dark alley. You would have questions answered, like what movie were they going to see? What time of year was it? But one of the changes that makes the biggest difference is who killed the Waynes and why. Depending upon how this is played, it can have a very interesting trickle down or rather ripple effect upon Batman and Gotham City. What it means for how and why he's fighting. They're very subtle differences, but they can lead to some very big changes.
changes in the story. Now, while Joe Chill is the criminal featured as far back as Detective Comics 33, he wasn't named until Batman 47 in 1948, which would give a more detailed version of Batman's origin in the final story of that issue, The Origin of the Batman. It's always nice when the title just tells you what to expect. Feel very secure. No surprises to be had. In that story, Batman discovers the crime boss he's hunting for is Joe Chill, the man who killed his parents. It's an issue that features a truly horrifying panel of young Bruce's eyes memorizing Chill's face. It also features the first instance of a very crucial moment for Batman, even though it's not one that's often brought into play in the modern era, modern time of recording. But it's still very powerful. And that is the confrontation between Bruce and Chill, where Bruce reveals himself to be Batman, directly linking his origins to Chill's actions. In the 1940s, it was just happenstance. There was no grand design, no big overall plan. Bruce was just the victim of a crime, as anybody could be. It was a very strong message that this kind of thing could happen to anybody. But what the effects of that could be, depending upon who it happened to, could be very interesting. And that those effects could traverse years, generations. It also causes more of a link between Batman and the general people of Gotham City. He's not above them. There aren't all kinds of shady underground organizations working to get them specifically because of their status. It just happened. So as you can see, it's very mild may vary as to why you could prefer one explanation over another. But in this era, that's what we're going with. It was 1948 too, so he could have straight up killed him, but he didn't. Batman didn't kill anymore by that point. <laughs> in a clever workaround, Chill ends up killed by his own hirelings for being the person to create Batman, but this before he can reveal who he is. It's a rather chilling moment. It's also a crucial one for a Brave and the Bold episode. We're gonna recreate this, but inside the confines of this universe. In this episode, we have an on-edge Batman searching for his parents' killer. He's pretty close to stepping over that precipice and almost does so while interrogating criminals, trying to get more information after learning the name Chill. However, the Phantom Stranger intervenes, taking him to the past, where this episode will continue to pull from the 1980s three-issue arc, The Untold Legend of Batman, written by Len Wein. A lot of that story is taken and repurposed for this episode down to the name of one of the gangsters that Batman was interrogating, Moxon. At the very least, they're taking from the first issue of that. The other two you can kind of push aside, but I mean, if you're gonna go read it, might as well read the whole thing. But if you just wanna compare and contrast for what's going to be in this episode specifically, the first issue, although some of the thematic elements, the third. But it's interesting to read that and then watch this. It's interesting to take all of the comics and then read them and then watch, and you can get a richer understanding of what this episode is trying to do. Batman in our episode gets to see his parents at a costume party, revealing his father in a Batman style getup, which in comics retcon the bat flying through the window is the inspo for the bat costume. This first retcon of that moment occurs in 1956, a bit of adding to it. It wasn't just a bat. This in Detective Comics 235. But the bat would come back edgier than ever. I like the version where it breaks through the glass. It's some kind of super bad. But for the moment and for the purposes of this episode, it was a subconscious nod to his father. A linkage again to legacy. In the episode, his parents are played by Adam West, 1960s Batman extraordinaire, and Julie Newmar, Catwoman from the same era. They're in the roles of Thomas and Martha, which is also fun if you add in the Earth 2 meta connection of Batman and Catwoman getting married. Fun fan headcanon connection things. This episode is just stacked and steeped in Batman history. If you're all up into the Batman lore, it's a real treat. And going back to the past, Batman even gets to fight alongside his father in a very heartwarming moment. But he also comes to learn that his parents' deaths weren't quite so random. We're not in Core of the Owls territory yet, so no cool hallucinating Batman, but we are in an era where this was vengeance by a gangster because Thomas Wayne got in his way. Although it's said that Chill was just supposed to scare them. He didn't have to go as far as he did. However, after learning all of this, because he's told it by the Spectre, who gave him the dark experience, whereas the Phantom Stranger gave him the light getting to see his parents and enjoy their presence experience, Batman is enraged. Nay, Bruce is enraged. This primes Batman towards his final showdown with Chill, who now sells weapons to supervillains. And then we get to see that scene. It's back from 1948, back from 1980, and it's brought to the screen, and it's still so visceral and impactful. I know because I watched it happen. I know because I am the son of the man you murdered. I am Bruce Wayne. This sequence has an added layer of significance when it pertains to this series, in that it's the first time that an adult Bruce Wayne is seen unmasked in the series. Before this, you maybe had some flashbacks of him as a kid, or if you saw his face, he was in disguise, like he will be later with matches, or his face was shrouded in darkness. But to actually see him as Bruce, hadn't happened before. And for this to be that first instance, the reveal, him revealing all of his pain and himself to the person who started it all, 
it's a lot. Also that added layer of all of this is happening while all of his villains stand outside. There's just so many layers of interpretation of that. This series was very much Batman and Batman mode most of the time. And so to see Bruce recognized as a whole person and not just Batman was unique. And while things like that had happened in Batman TAS, the fact that it was occurring here felt very different. It was an interesting experience in a series that had yet to do so. Now this episode was written by Paul Dini, a core creator on Batman TAS. So the more in-depth look isn't surprising, but it manages to be married with the established world of Brave and the Bold without breaking it or feeling out of place. Again, showcasing that the overall lighthearted nature of Brave and the Bold was a choice, not an indication other avenues weren't possible. He knows who you are. If this man lives, Batman dies. Batman may die, but Bruce Wayne Never. The divide between Bruce, Batman, how much of one is in the other, how intermingled and separate are they is interesting. Although for some, the actual playing out of basically angel and devil on shoulder may be a bit too on the nose and a bit much, especially depending upon how many times you've seen the trope. However, it is really well implemented here. It presents a fascinating case and the episode allows the original ending for Chill to play out. Only now, instead of random gangsters, it's Batman's established villains who play a part in his demise and probably the Spectre. Chill still dies, we got a dead chill on screen. <laughs> However, Batman did decide to stay the path of justice over vengeance. And it's rewarding and in a way mirrors the overall tone of this series. It's an important episode in the series overall and a powerful one full of strong moments, like Bruce enshrining his father's costume in the Batcave. Case closed. This episode really speaks to the meta statement that the writers and creators of the show made through Batmite while it was being critiqued as it was on air, and that's that Batman has a rich history and as such can be interpreted a variety of ways, and one isn't necessarily more valid than the other. So long as they stay true to the core, you could get invalid if you went too far. You can always go too far, but the spirit of the sentiment, especially because they are staying inside of the confines, it makes sense. This episode shows that overall sentiment and manages to weave together so many different fragments of Batman's history, all inside of a slightly darkened version of their overall lighter tone. It's a beautiful episode from an oft times overlooked series and proof positive that one doesn't have to be gratuitous or constant or over the top to pack a punch. Sometimes by being selective, it can be even more effective. What did you think of this episode? Did you know it had so many callbacks to the comics? Were you a fan of this series? And if so, what were your favorite episodes? Should we check any of them out? Let me know down below. And while you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this time out of day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.